All right. Good evening, everybody. I hope you are all doing well. We have a ton, I'm going to say it again, a ton to cover tonight. So instead of breaking it up into like multiple chapters, they just decided, <laughs> let's throw it all together. So what ended up happening is, is we're going to go through basic agency relationships. Uh, disclosure and duty of clients. So we're going to cover a lot this evening. Uh, so this first slide here basically shows you what we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to talk about the defining agency, what the authority is of a real estate agent, also the different classifications, uh, and you can go ahead. And also we're going to talk about the fiduciary duties and the responsibilities, and also the information about brokerage services. Okay, go ahead. All right, so let's get started. So in regards to agency, now like we said yesterday, agency is where we are representing another party. So I end up, Ms. Davenport, if I am representing you, you are my client, therefore I have fiduciary duty, we have an agency agreement here, okay? So agency occurs when one person, the agent acts on behalf of another person and the principal and under the person's control. So number one in this situation is when we have an agency agreement, there are certain things and we're gonna talk about that tonight. There are certain things Mr. Davenport, that I owe you as your agent and there are certain things you owe me as the principal, okay? So in this particular situation, Agency occurs when one person, which we call the agent, acts on behalf of another person, which is called the principal, and under that person's control. So if you see here, the principal is going to control the agent, not the other way around. A lot of people assume that I, as the agent, control my principal. That's incorrect. As the agent, the agent works on behalf of that individual, okay? So again, there may be times, for example, Mr. Stahl, I may represent him, and I may say, Mr. Stahl, don't you dare sell your house for 200,000, you can get 300. And Mr. Stahl may tell me, but, but hold on, Mr. Justin, I end up in this particular situation, I wanna go over and I wanna refer, or I wanna accept the offer at a lower price. Just because I may not agree with it does not mean that I can make a change. It's ultimately up to Mr. Stahl if he wants to accept that agreement, okay? He makes that decision. Now, again, like we said, the agent works for the client or the principal, okay? And therefore, there are certain duties that are owed to that client or that uh, principal, okay? So, <clears throat> There will be times in real estate that there are going to be situations where, you know, me and Travis may not agree. And there's even times that not only client or Travis is a client, but Travis is my real estate agent. Me and Travis may disagree on a transaction. However, Mr. Travis, let's say in real life that you have a client right now and I tell you, well, Travis, I don't think you should do it that way. And you're like, but no, no, I think it needs to be this way. Who's, whose direction do you have to follow? Yours. Yeah, so even if you disagree with me as an agent, do you, can, can, do you still have to do what I say as your broker? Yes. Yes. But what if you are my client and I say you're incorrect? Now do you have to listen to me? No. No, and not at all. I should, Why? I should probably, but. You should, but most likely it's your decision. My decision. Okay, so in that particular situation is we want to make certain that people understand these differences. Can you, uh, can you get them a copy as well as the slides, just a copy of yours? Um, so authority of the agent, okay? The authority of the agent basically requires the consent of both principal and the agent. So, Ms. Uh, Davenport, if I come over today and I say, Ms. Davenport, I'd like to list your property, you're going to be and you're going to sign an agreement, a listing contract, and you're going to give me certain authority to act on your behalf. Because do you want to, it, would you like this, think about this, Ms. Davenport, 
we all put your contract out there. Do you want to field every phone call that comes in on your property? Do you want to have to read all the contracts? Do you really want to deal with all of that if you have an agent? No, that's you, you're hiring me to do that, right? So as a real estate agent, your, your client, the principal, is giving the broker, your broker, the right to do things on their behalf, okay? There will be certain things that the client does not need to deal with. I had one time, I had an agent that every phone call that came through, the client, an agent would call her, she'd get the phone call and then she'd say, oh, okay, well, hold on, I'll have the client call you. That's not how this works, okay? You take the call, you get the information, then you relay it to your client, give your professional opinion, and then you let that client make a decision and you relay it back to the person. But I can tell you in real estate, Mr. Travis and Stefan and all that's been with me, they can all tell you, do clients, Travis, all the time agree with what advice you give them? No. No. And sometimes they may go the complete opposite from what you want. Okay. Now, again, it requires the consent of both the principal and the agent. Okay. The principal is in control of and is liable for the agent's conduct on the principal's behalf. Let's say that again. The principal is in control of and liable for the agent's conduct. So let's play this out, Mr. Eugene. All right, you hired me as your agent, because I'm a broker. So you're the principal, I'm the broker, and you hire me, but I assign Travis to be your agent, okay? You tell Mr. Travis that you will accept $350,000 for your house, but don't tell nobody that, that's just between you and Travis. You want Travis to go out and put four hundred thousand on your house, okay? So Miss Davenport calls Mr. Travis and says, "Hey, Travis, how's it going, man? Remember me from class?" Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything going good? Oh yeah. Great, great. <laughs> hey, so I see Eugene's got his house up for sale. Uh, what's his lowest uh, lowest number he'll take? I got a client that's interested. And Travis says, "Well, Miss Davenport." He can, uh, he'll take 350, okay? He told me that, he can take 350. Okay, well Travis, what if I submit an offer at 325? You think I, you can get Eugene to do that? Yeah, yeah, let me see what I can do. No problem. No problem, let me see. He's easy. Yeah, so he goes and he calls you, and he says, Mr. Eugene, guess what, great news. I got you an offer at 325. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I said 350, <laughs> but it's 325. I, I said I lost going 350. I want 400. Oh, you want 400? Well, oh, hold on. Let me let me uh let me call this client, Miss Davenport, back. I'll get back with you. So he calls Miss Davenport. Miss Davenport, this guy's just being difficult. Just send him 350. She says, okay, we'll do 350. Now, Mr. Eugene, is Travis looking out for your best interest? No. Whose interest is he looking, looking out, for? out for hers? He's looking out for her client. Yeah. Okay. And he's probably looking out for his own because he's getting a paycheck. Uh -huh. Okay. So the thing is, is are you in control in that situation? No. No, who's actually in control? Yeah. Travis is taking it. So in that situation is that's unacceptable. Yeah. You have to end up, if at any time I've had an agent before I had to have a long talk with. The agent would get a listing, the client would say, this is my lowest ball figure, and then she would relay that to other agents. Unacceptable, period. You cannot relay that information, and we're going to talk about that tonight because it's confidentiality. What you talk to your client about stays with you, nobody else, okay? And in that situation, Mr. Eugene should have immediately contacted me and said, I am not pleased with Travis's basically demeanor. He's not following the rules, and I want him off my deal. I'm a great, I'm a great guy. <laughs> uh huh. So, in that situation, is, is that comes into that point where I, as the broker, must step in and say, Mr. Stahl, you, you need to get your crap together, basically. Okay. So, again, 
the principal needs to understand that they are in control. Mr. Grossman can give you a prime example. He has a house right now that he's listing or that he's been dealing with. In that particular situation, he tried to advise his client and his client would not listen to it. Would not listen to it. Okay. But Travis, I mean, not Travis, Mr. Grossman, if your client does not listen to you, do you still have to do what they say? Yes. Yes. But what if it's you professionally know that it's way too high or way too low. Do you still have to do what they say? You still have to listen. You still have a duty to listen. Okay. So in that situation, the principal, no matter what, is in control. And they are liable for any actions. So in that situation is, let's turn this around. Let's say Miss Leela has a house. And she wants me to list her house for her. So I go over there and I say, Miss Leela, I'll list your house. And I put it on the market. And Miss Leela tells me that there's termites. And I'm like, oh goodness, I better not disclose that to Colton. Because if I disclose that to Colton, what's going to end up happening is, is then he's going to tell his client he's going to throw the whole deal apart. So I'm not going to say nothing. I ain't going to say nothing. I keep it much hush. So I can make this transaction go through. Well, guess what? If I end up here, I don't tell Miss Leela or I don't tell Colton about this, and I don't tell Leela about it, who's getting sued? You. you. No. Oh, Miss Leela. Oh, she's loud. Miss Leela told me, and I did not disclose it. Remember, Miss Leela is the principal. Yeah, she's, she's in control, control of me. Yeah. If I don't disclose it, yeah. guess what? Miss Leela's coming after Justin. Yeah. Miss Leela's coming here after me. Okay. So in that situation is Justin has to get his crap together and get it together. Otherwise, Miss Leela could be sued because of my misconduct. Okay. So it's very imperative that you explain this to your clients because, again, this is where a lot of people get confused that they think the agent's in control of the situation when in reality it is the client that's in it. That's why I do the research. We get the stuff. My agents always ask me stuff and will come in. Hey, I did this. I found this information out. What do you think we need to do? And my response is, call your client. Call your client. I can't make the decision. I'll give you my advice, but call your client. Because my advice may say to do this. My client may say, hey, accept this person. I think it's a great deal. But my seller or my landlord or my buyer, whoever may say, heck no. Okay. So in that situation, you're going to have those differences. Now, you are going to have to know this slide. This is very important. Okay. The very first thing that you need to be aware of is this universal agency. Okay. Universal agency is basically the broadest scope and power of the, of the agencies altogether. Okay. So when Miss Leela goes over and she ends up, she wants, say, for example, she wants to allow somebody to sign on her behalf. Miss Leela would use a power of attorney, which gives that individual the right to sign on her behalf. Okay. But again, it's not common in real estate. You don't go to your client and say, Hey, Mr. Grossman, you want to sell your house here? Sign a power of attorney. Okay. Because when you do that, what ends up happening? Well, at that point, I'm taking on a ton of liability. I'm taking on a huge amount of liability. Okay? So, you do not use a power of attorney in a transaction. It is only for family members or friends. Say that I'm going in to have massive heart surgery or something. Well, I may decide, Mr. Eugene, you're my power of attorney. I want you to take care of my decisions while I'm under. Okay? Just like when the president of the United States goes under, the vice president steps up while the president's down. That's how it works. So the universal agency basically is that point that Mr. Eugene or anybody appointed can make decisions on that person's behalf. Okay. Now, general agency is authority that is conduct through a series of transactions. They're a longer term, they're broader authority, and they're oftentimes, so you'll see the difference. Here's universal. This one's general. These are a longer term. They're broader authority. And this is where you're going to see them in. 
So like Travis and Mr. Stephan here, they both have a general agency with me. They can end up have certain broad authority on my behalf, on Justin's behalf, okay? Because of the fact of the matter is, is that Mr. Stephan and Mr. Travis have to be able to make decisions that are going to benefit me and them, okay? Imagine if, uh, say for example, uh, Mr. Eugene, in this situation, you go over, you meet Ms. Davenport to list her property, Ms. Davenport asked a question, and you gotta call me. Every time she has a question, you gotta call me. Hey, uh, Ms. Davenport wants to know, can we put a lockbox on our house? Yeah, that's fine. Hang up. Hey, Ms. Davenport wants a sign. Can we put a sign on our house? Yeah, that's fine. That would take forever, wouldn't it, Ms. Davenport? Every single little thing, that's not going to work. So with a general agency, you can go out and make a contract with Ms. Davenport and bind me into a contract with Ms. Davenport, even with me not being in the transaction. Okay? So in that situation, Mr. Eugene, you can sit down with Ms. Davenport and y'all draw up a whole listing contract, put all the terms in there, and you can sign. And when you sign, guess what? You've now bound me, even though I've never met Ms. Davenport in my life, you have bound me to her to list her property. Okay? And let me tell you, there are times that my agents sign contracts, I review them, I agree to them and all that, but there are times I never meet the client. I never meet them. Because here's the thing. If Miss Davenport, let's say she comes on with me and she's practicing in Dallas, Travis is down in Galveston, Stefan's out in El Paso, Mr. Eugene, you're over here in, in uh, West Texas, it's impossible for me to get to meet everybody. Very difficult. Okay? So in that situation, is it allows for the agent to make signatures on behalf of the client or the, the, the broker okay a landlord property manager this is basically when we talk property manager again we're still talking about a broker remember that agent cannot they can be a property manager but they're under a broker but the landlord property manager is also another one mr eugene do you want to have to make decisions and take calls on every little tiny little thing that goes wrong with your property collect rent and all no that's what a property manager is for Okay, so it's the same kind of concept. It's very long-term and it's broad authority. Now, in Rule 22 of the Texas Administrative Code, 535.2, TREC is responsible, or the responsibility of the broker, or responsibility on the broker is for the conduct of their business activities. Okay, so what my agents do falls back on me. So if Travis is out there running his mouth about, you know, oh, Mr. Eugene can do this, blah, 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 that is a failure on me because he's doing it, okay? You have to make certain that's why they're in the rule. And that's why it's very important that I, as a real estate broker, have trainings and discussions and watch things because of the fact of the matter is, is breaches of confidentiality, which is one of the highest forms can get me into trouble, and if I get into trouble, what happens to all my agents? They lose their license, okay? A lot of times, for example, if this occurred to you, uh, Mr. Grossman, say for example, that you get a phone call today, and uh, Chuck Norris is on the other line, and he says, I want you to represent me and sell my property, but I don't want nobody to know about it that you're representing me. So I want you to handle all my stuff. We're going to do this off the books, but you're going to sell my property for me. Okay, so it's not going on the MLS. What's the first thing you probably want to go do? Tell everybody that you're representing Chuck Norris. Exactly. Run around, tell everybody, Miss Davenport, guess what? Chuck Norris, I'm you representing him. You ain't going to believe that, girl. Guess what, Mr. Eugene? Chuck Norris, I'm representing him. What? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, guess what? You do that, and you breached confidentiality. Okay. You cannot share confidentiality or confidential information with anyone, even your own family members. Because of the fact is, is that it is a breach of contract. So I tell a lot of husband and wife couples, 
I hope you don't get your license because everybody wants to talk about it. Why? That's what happens. You're proud of yourself. But if that person accidentally slips up and says something, guess what? We're screwed. Okay. So in that I have a question. Yes, Miss Leela. So let's say the Chuck Norris situation. Yes, ma'am. Once the deal is done and whatever business is settled, it, do you still keep it as confidential? Yes, ma'am. Confidentiality runs for the life of the entire transaction and past it. Okay. So, so you can never, you can say this, Miss Leela. You can say I sold a property at, say, Chuck Norris's house is at one two three Main Street. You mm -hmm. can say I sold one two three Main Street. Or, well, you can't say the price, but you say I sold one two three Main Street on such and such date, and people that know Chuck Norris's address would know you sold the property. But you can, the only way you can get around that is if Chuck Norris actually signed off and said you can't advertise with his name. But otherwise, you cannot disclose it to anyone. The only thing you can disclose is after the sale's done that you sold the property address, and you can't even tell the, the sold price. You can only say I sold this property address. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have I have another question to follow up on that. Yeah. So what about whenever you're like giving out comparables for like like houses sold in the area? Can you you're telling them how much it was sold for? So here's the thing on that. It's a very fine line when you start doing that. If you are the one that sold property, so here's the thing. If you have sold three houses on a street, you can take your three houses and come to an average, but you can never put the house address and the sold price together. If you do, that's a breach of confidentiality and can end up getting you into a lot of trouble. Okay, but, let me just shut my mouth now. <laughs> but you can, in some situations, Enrique, you can in that situation, you can say, you know, one of two ways. You can say, I sold one, two, three Main Street, two, three, four Main Street, and four, three, five Main Street. And so what if, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. So what if somebody else sold it? We, you can still like on the, what is it? NMLS, you can pull all that information, right? For how so, much it sold for you. So you cannot, you cannot put out their sold data. If you put sold data out, that's a breach of confidentiality. So only thing you can put out there is basically either the addresses or the overall sales price, but they can never be able to put the two together. If you see what I'm saying, it's kind, okay. of, it's kind of stupid how it's set up. So like, if you wanted to end up, you want to make yourself look good. You could say something like this. I sold three houses on main street for an average of $400,000. Well, if there's been three houses on Main Street, you're the, the only listing agent for those three, well, then they're going to know about what it is. But that's not a breach. It's when you go in and say, I sold 123 Main Street for $200,000, that's where you end up having that breach and, and Trek will come in and investigate. Okay. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So, and that's, and those are good questions. And we'll talk about those as we go along, but those are good questions. All right. So, Again, this is what we call special agency. Now, in special agency, this is what every time you get when you represent somebody. So say, for example, that uh, Enrique is going over and he is representing an individual. He's going to have a special agency, okay? Because it's a shorter term and it's for a limited authority. So when he sells somebody's property, he has a listing agreement. And once he ends up finishing that listing contract, his agency's done, okay? So once he completes his task, his listing agreement is now done, he's finished, he moves on, okay? Same thing with the buyer's representation. A lot of people always ask, well, I'm gonna go lock, say Enrique calls you Mr. Eugene and he says, I'm gonna go lock Mr. Eugene into a long-term contract, okay? So he's gonna go over here and lock you into a 10-year buyer representation. So any transaction over 10 years, you got to pay Enrique, even if you don't use it. Okay. Can't do that because what does a special agency say? Limited authority and shorter term. So you cannot lock somebody into a buyer representation for long term. Okay. It has to be short term. 
Okay. Now, there was two cases. Okay, there was two cases, two court cases. And basically what this says in the case study is that a real estate agent can never, never bind the principal to a contract. So let's play this hypothetical out. Mr. Keith ends up, he's representing Mr. Jacob. So Mr. Keith, you're the listing agent. Your client is Mr. Jacob. Miss Leela, you're representing Miss Davenport. Okay. So Miss Leela is the buyer's agent. Keith is a listing agent. Okay. Now, Mr. Keith and Miss Leela back and forth are talking to their clients and all. And Mr. Keith says, well, if you can get Miss Davenport to agree, Leela, to purchase the house at $300,000, then Miss Leela in that situation is, I think we got a contract. And Miss Leela texts back and says, okay, she'll, she'll agree to that. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Miss Leela cannot bind you, Miss Davenport, into a contract. Miss Leela can only tell Miss Davenport, and Miss Davenport ultimately makes that final decision. So in these two court cases, and trust me, you don't have to know these in real life, so you don't have to worry about the test of knowing all this stuff, but the key thing that you need to know is that an agent cannot bind their principal to a contract. Now, I will tell you this. A lot of people will try to argue that Miss Leela did put her into a contract, but in reality, she cannot. There can never be an agent that forces their client into a contract, okay? No matter if Miss Leela goes over here and texts and writes it out or whatever, that yes, Miss Davenport will accept your offer until it is signed by Miss Davenport, it is still classified in negotiations, okay? A lot of people get that confused, but you cannot. Now, the key thing I tell my agents all the time is, is you don't just go over there, like if Miss Leela was my agent, I'm gonna tell Miss Leela, don't you ever say something like that. Miss Leela, I wanna tell you, is your, your response should be this. If Keith says, if Miss Davenport accepts 300,000, the response needs to be, I think she might go for it, but let me check with her and I'll get back to you, okay? That's how you always leave it. Don't ever say, my client will accept that offer, because you don't know. Miss Leela, you may go back to Miss Davenport today, Miss Davenport and say, yeah, I thought about it, I don't want that house no more. I've been there before, okay? So again, you need to be aware of that. So this is where it gets fun. We got some nice charts here tonight. Okay, so in this particular situation, the seller landlord or the buyer tenant is going to be the client. Okay, and for them to be a client, Ms. Davenport, what is what has to be signed? It needs to be what type? It needs to be a contract, right? right. So there has to be a contract for that person to be called a, a client. If they don't have a signed contract, then what's that person called? A customer. Okay. See, she got this down. You better just go there and cheat by her. <laughs> <laughs> so in this situation, I, I just got that point. <laughs> <laughs> but in that situation is, yes, you've got in this situation, if there's a signed contract, then in that situation, we call them a client. But if we do not have a signed contract, they are a customer. So for them to be a client, there has to be a broker. Mr. Eugene, question right now, this is how life is. Can Stefan be this person? No. Why not? Because he doesn't have a broker. Why? Because he's not a broker. Right. Stefan is not a broker, and since Stefan's not a broker, what happens? Because he's not a broker, he ends up, he he's down here, right. he's a sales associate, but he is not a broker. So in that situation, there can never be a agent, a special agent in regards to a salesperson that's going to have this relationship. Okay. So what they're showing you is it's like a funnel. Okay. So we say, for example, say that we use Mr. Keith as an example. Mr. Keith is a seller. So he's here at the top. He's the top box. Now, Mr. Keith comes to Justin, who is the broker 
and wants Justin to represent him. So Keith has came to me, me and him rep or come to an agreement. So Keith's my client, I'm the broker, so I'm his special agent. And then I end up assign it either to a sales agent or what we call a broker associate, which is an individual that has a broker's license with that broker. So in that situation is I can assign it to either Stefan or I can sign it to another broker that's in my office. Okay. So in this situation is, does that how is Stefan, I'm going to ask you as a, as a person that practices, is this how it works all the time? Does a client walk in, come talk straight to me, and then I sign it out to y'all? How's it work? Well, who are they going to most likely, who are these people going to normally talk to? Me or to y'all? No, They're going to go from here to the top straight to the sales agent. Okay? The but, sales agent will go to the broker. Well, that's correct. But technically, even though they're going from here, so for example, Enrique comes in today, wants to look at your listing, Enrique is not going to call Justin and talk to Justin and then go talk to you. Enrique is going to call you, but ultimately from the legal standpoint, he's not breaking any rules. It's just basically because we have an agreement, he can come straight to you, if you see what I'm saying. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, what is fiduciary? What exactly is this thing called fiduciary that he keeps talking about here? Well, fiduciary is what we call the highest good faith level. It's the highest of the highest, okay? It excludes all selfish interest. So, Mr. Eugene, I want to buy the same property you want. I can't because I have fiduciary duty with you, okay? My duties is to you, not to my own interest. There are special duties as well. These are those ones that go beyond the agreements, okay? There is also, we have to put our clients first. We cannot put Justin Nobles or Stephen Grossman or Travis Stahl in front of everybody else. We have to put our clients first. And some duties can be contracted away, okay? And this is where that is that intermediary. There can end up being a situation where that one agent, come back here, let's go back for a second, come back here, an agent, a seller, goes to Stefan down here as a sales associate, and then not only does he get the seller, but now the buyer comes to, to Stefan. At that point, that now creates me as an intermediary, and I have to split those people like it shows at the bottom. Okay? All right. So, here's a good mnemonic here for you. They should have old man, but that, that would be you, Dad. So, where it should be, it's old car, all right? And so what happens is, this is what we call the fiduciary duties. Okay, these are your fiduciary duties. These is, number one, there's obedience. Okay, there's obedience, there's loyalty, there's disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, and reasonable care and diligence. I, as a real estate broker, owe all of these items to my client. If my client is Darren, then my client, I owe them all of these right here, every one. I have to obey his wishes, even if his wishes are inconsistent with what I'm telling him. I have to be loyal to my client. I have to be full disclosure. Anything that's told to me that he allows me to release, I have to release it. I have to be confidential. There has to be confidentiality. I cannot disclose information to anyone, to anyone, okay? The accounting part, I have to account for monies that are given. If Darren gives me $5,000 for earnest money, guess what? Justin's got to account for that $5,000 and show him where the money's at, okay? And I also have to give reasonable care and diligence, okay? These are my duties as a real estate broker, and these are also the same duties 
that you as a salesperson are going to own. When you're representing somebody, same ones here. Okay. Now, what about trade associations? All right. The reason that we talked about this is because what occurred was prior to all these associations, here's what happened. A lot of times what we ended up finding out was that clients ended up, they were not following these rules. Okay. I'm not clients, agents. We're not following these rules. Okay. So what happened was is they created trade associations. We can't get everybody knowledgeable. Let's just get them all together as an association and let's educate them. Okay. So there are three main ones that you'll see. There is NAR, which is National Association of Realtors, and then there is TAR or TR for Texas Realtors, okay? And then you have your local associations that have their own boards, okay? In these situations, NAR and TAR and local boards, all of them follow the Realtor Code of Ethics, okay? Thankfully, y'all are welcome, Y'all do not have to read that. When you get your real estate license, guess what? You get to spend a, how long is it, six hours? I think uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty much all day. Six, almost a full day. When I did it, it was eight and a half hours. That's how long the tip is? Huh? That's how long the tip is? No, no, no. This is when you, after you passed and got sponsored, oh. you get to go to join, because you have to join all three of these if you want to be called a realtor. So here's, let me go into that a little bit more. Okay. So, when you finish your courses here and you pass your exam and you get sponsored, you're not called a realtor. You're just a real estate agent. Okay. If you want to be called a realtor, you have to join NAR, TAR in your local association. So if you want to use that term, that trademark, you have to end up joining these three here at the top in order to be called a realtor. Okay, so a lot of people think after I finish my real estate courses and I pass my exam, I'm now a realtor. But it is only allowed to be used by those that are a member of these boards. Okay, now the thing about this is, is when you join these boards, you have to use this code of ethics. So you're adhering to these codes. Okay, now they're also. The key difference here is you'll see down here at the bottom, we're talking about TREC canons of professional ethics and conduct. These are what TREC, this is what the licensing body says, okay? The licensing body says in this particular situation that you have to act a certain way and be trusted a certain way and all of that. However, here's the good thing. This is more of a minimum standard. The code of ethics is more of a higher standard, okay? More up here as a code of ethics than with the canons. But basically what it comes down to is in this situation is, these are gonna be the groups that you're going to join and they keep you in line with your duties as an agent. Now, as we've talked here, we have the very first one is care. There is a higher standard of care to your client. There are certain duties for buyers and sellers of course, we're going to list those out right there. So it is your duty to a buyer or seller is you have to discover and disclose relevant facts, prepare and explain any contractual provisions, and keep principles focused on deadlines. Here's what happens most of the time. Miss, uh, let's see here. Let me check over here real quick. Um, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett goes over here in this particular situation. And Mr. Garrett ends up, he uh, he basically, he gets his client under contract, all right? He gets his client under contract. He's all ecstatic. He's like, yeah, I got my first client under contract. Here you go, Miss Linda. I'm, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go celebrate, okay? So he leaves for the entire weekend, all right? Well, here's the thing. His principals don't know what's going on, and he missed the deadline. He's breached his duty. He has a duty to make certain that he is discovering and disclosing facts, keeping their clients on deadline, contractual provisions. I'm going to put it this way. If you're a person with poor time management, be ready because you're going to learn it. 
You're going to learn it the easy way or you're going to learn it the hard way, but you're going to learn it. Okay? You have to keep on these deadlines. You have to keep your clients updated. You have to disclose things. This is your first step. The duties that are for, just for seller and clients are going to be basically the duty from care if that person is a seller. you got to help them determine an appropriate list price. Now, like I said earlier, Mr. Travis and Mr. Uh, Stephan can tell you, they can go tell a client how much to list the property for, but are they going to listen to you all the time? Nope. Nope. Not at all. Okay? They're not going to listen to you all the time. But you have to go in and attempt to try to get them to understand. Next, you also have to aggressively market and advertise. Now, let me explain something here. A lot of agents get this confused. A lot of agents do this. They go out, they get a sign, they put a sign in the yard, they put it on the MLS, and then they come over here and they sit down in their corner and go, one day, one day somebody's going to end up, they'll buy the house. I just got to sit here and wait. Is this, is this right? No, it don't work like that. Because let me tell you, you as a real estate agent, just because you put the house on the market and you ended up, you went over and you put a sign up, you're not doing your duty. This isn't a, this isn't a part of a contract. This is your requirement with your license. Just holding the license. You have to aggressively market and advertise. See, I see agents a lot of times, they'll put the house on the MLS, and they'll put a sign in the yard, and that's it. I ask them, well, have you hosted an open house? Nope. Have you opened a realtor door? Nope. Have you ended up putting anything on social media? Nope. Well, then what the heck are you doing? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Well, I didn't know I had to do that. Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of your duties. Okay. This is actually one of the areas also that real estate agents get sued about, is they're not following up with their duties of marketing. You also have to investigate material facts. So here's the thing, Mr. Eugene, do you know every single little thing about your house? No. And you probably don't know it all. See, there's one agent here in town, I love her to death. She ends up, she goes around, and she actually goes and searches the county records. She goes through and looks about everything about it. She finds everything out about that house, and she discloses it. Okay? Truthfully, she's doing the right thing because she's investigating. She's finding everything out about that house, okay? If you're dealing with buyers only, so this is just buyers, you have to find a reasonableness of an asking price, okay? So if I'm representing, if I'm selling uh, Mr. Colton's property, well, Mr. Travis, if you're representing Mr. Eugene and putting an offer in, Mr. Travis needs to actually look and see is my asking price reasonable, okay? That's his duty. He also has to do, and this is one of the key ones, he has to aggressively search for properties. I hear this sometimes. Well, I don't have to look for properties. They got Zillow. They got Realtor.com. They'll look it up themselves. Here's the problem. That's a breach. You're supposed to constantly be searching for properties. You don't have time to sit there. Your client finds out that you're not sending them properties and Shrek finds out, <laughs> your license is gone. Okay? You have to consistently be looking for properties and showing them. Okay? Now, let me go back to this. Does this mean, however, that you show your client every single property that's out there in the world? No. 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 You, you have to put a limit because I can guarantee you. I guarantee you I'll probably have somebody in this classroom, if I sent them 100 properties, I guarantee you that person will want to see all 100 properties, okay? So in that situation is, you have to aggressively search, but you also have to explain to your client what the limitations are. Because I'm not going to go show Miss Leela two bed, two bad houses when she's wanting a four bed, four bad house. Okay, it's a waste of my time, okay? I also have to investigate any material facts. I've had times before where my client was like, well, I wonder if this house ever flooded. We asked the, agent, the seller's agent, the seller's agent, like, we don't know. So my client said, well, I wonder if it has. Do you think the neighbor knows? 
<laughs> Guess what? What does that basically mean? It means Justin gets to go do what? <laughs> Thomas Davenport, my name's Justin Ellis. I'm a real estate broker. And my client was wondering, hey, do you know if this house ever flooded? That's your job. That's your job. You can't say, oh, I'm shy. I don't, I don't, I don't want to knock on that door. Sorry, that's not part of this job. You're a salesperson. You have to get I had a question. Yes, ma'am. When it comes to that, as far as finding out if a property has flooded, is there like a area where you can get that information? So there is not. What happens, Miss Leela, in that situation is normally if a person's selling a house, there is a seller's disclosure that they're supposed to state. Has there been any flooding or insurance claims for flooding? And they're supposed to disclose it. Now, if the client does not disclose it, the seller doesn't, they open themselves up to being sued down the road if you find out about it. So oh, okay. there's not like a, a database. There's just, they have to disclose it. Now, I'll tell you a little a workaround around that, okay? What you could do is you could go down to the county and ask the county, hey, do you have any permit request for this property? And if the county has permit requests, it will tell you where they did repairs and you can end up finding out if it was caused for flooding or something to that nature. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, I understand. Thank you. Very well. Very good. So in that situation is we have to make certain that we are doing our investigation. Okay. You also have to recommend the use of experts. I go out and my, my best friend, Mr. Travis, he just decided yesterday he wants to start a handyman service. So I'm like, Mr. Travis, he, he wants to be a handyman. Hey, Miss Davenport, I know you need some work done. So I'm just like my, my new friend that just never did it before. He's going to come do some handyman work in your house. How do you feel about that, Miss Davenport? No, I'm all, no, not at all, right? What's a hammer? What's a hammer? <laughs> Definitely, no. Definitely no, right? <laughs> so in that situation, it is. Yeah, it doesn't sound like an expert at all. So in that situation is, if you don't want to end up, <laughs> you don't want to end up. I have hands. <laughs> in this situation, you have to use experts, all right? You can't end up using your own friends or your own family. I've had that happen before. Right. You also have a duty for both sides, seller or uh, buyer, you have to have basic knowledge of real estate law. I have clients that sometimes want me to do things that are unethical, but are not illegal. Okay. I have to make a decision on that. I have clients that want me to do things that are illegal. I have a duty to explain that. Okay. I have to tell them, no, you can't do that. I'm sorry. Unless you want to get sued. And if you want to still do it, bye-bye. I don't, I don't want to deal with you anymore because I don't want to be in that. Okay. Also, agents do more than just act as fiduciaries. Okay. And we're going to talk about that as we go on. The next one is obedience. You have to follow the lawful instructions of your client. So if, for example, Darren tells Stefan, hey, Stefan, I want you to go because I hear that, you know, putting marijuana on my property is actually going to increase the value. So I want you to go get some marijuana and plant it on my property. Well, that's not lawful instruction. You don't have to obey that. Okay. It is in Colorado. In Colorado, yes. But here, <laughs> no. Okay. You can't do things like that. You can't do, you cannot end up in certain situations. For example, Mr. Eugene, he goes over. And he calls Mr. Uh, Travis, for example. Because Eugene calls Mr. Travis and tells Mr. Travis that uh, Mr. Eugene calls Travis. Uh, and he ends up in that particular situation. Mr. Eugene says, Travis, hey, there, if there's electricity out to my barn, then guess what ends up happening? I can get more price or value. So I want you to come out and help me, Mr. Travis, dig a trench and run some electricity. And I, I have no no knowledge of what I'm doing. I'm just going to run some electricity. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. Oh yeah. Not going to happen. Okay. That's going to be a test. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to test it with those hands. I need to hands So in that situation is, yes, you have to follow only lawful instructions. You also, in the situation, you have to, the client has to choose the expert, not you. OK. 
okay? I can give recommendations, and the rule here is this. You can give, or you should give, three people, okay? You should give three people that you recommend, but you never choose the expert for them. What did I say there, Mr. Eugene? Don't choose the expert for them. They, they choose it. I do not ever choose who the person's supposed to use. I simply give the data, the information, the client chooses the expert. The client also approves of the agent's actions. Client can end up at any point, just like a lawyer. When you're hired, when you hire an attorney, yeah, the attorney may make, give you advice. They may say, I don't recommend you testify, but it's ultimately your choice. You choose. I may tell Mr. Eugene, don't you dare get up there on that stand and testify because you testify, we're pretty much done. Mr. Eugene can still get on that stand. Okay, same thing in real estate. I may advise him, Mr. Eugene, don't you dare go over and put an offer on this house. It's a horrible house. And if he says, I don't care what you say, Justin, I'm putting an offer, he's putting an offer. Okay, so in that particular situation, we have to make certain that they understand that the client approves of the actions of those individuals. Also, you need to withdraw from a client's transaction if they want you to do illegal activity. If a client tells you, hey, Ms. Davenport, I want you to go put some marijuana in the back so that you know it increases the value, you immediately say, I ain't got time for that. I'm out of here, okay? Um, Y'all do what you want, but I'm gone, okay? You do not do illegal instruction, okay? I'm sorry, I have another question. Yes, ma'am. When it comes to that, and if, if you're already on I think it's called contract um and they're starting to do or request illegal things is there another form or some you, formal process of withdrawing so what you do is as a salesperson you go to your broker you tell your broker that you don't feel comfortable working with that client anymore and the broker will then make a decision to either remove himself or herself from the transaction or they may just reassign the whole thing to another agent in the office so it depends okay how bad the the illegal instruction is, if that makes sense. Okay, I understand. So for, for example, if Mr. Eugene in that situation is trying to wire stuff illegally, it may not be extremely bad versus somebody wanting somebody to put marijuana on their property. So, so it really comes down to how bad the situation is, but it's the only person that can really withdraw is the broker, not the salesperson. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So again, now in loyalty, you have in this situation, you have to act in the client's best interest, okay? It's again, the agreement between the broker and the client and the sales associate represents the broker, okay? And those are basic things we've already talked about. Now, examples of loyal obligations would, of course, try to get the best price and the terms. That's your job, okay? You have to end up. Now, here's one that I always like to throw out here all the time. Mr. Garrett, are you on tonight, sir? What'd you say? All right, you're on. I was just making sure you're on tonight. So I got a question for you. Yes, sir. Right. So you are representing, um, you're representing Miss Leela in a transaction. And you're the seller's agent. So you're representing Miss Leela, you're listing her property. And uh, Miss Davenport calls you and she says, hey, uh, I've got a client that's interested in putting a contract in on your property that you have listed. Do you have any listing or any offers currently on the table? And in reality, Garrett, you don't have no offers, zero. But you tell Miss Davenport, oh yeah, I've got, I got a few coming in. Uh, we recommend you put in your highest and best. Are you breaking any laws there, Mr. Garrett? Um, I would say no. He's not. He's not breaking anything because of the fact is he might actually get some offers that come in. Except for the good law of the Lord. Except for the good, yeah. He might, who knows? He might. He didn't say, I am. He said, I think I have some maybe coming in. It's the wording. 
So in that situation is Garrett would not be breaking any of the rules or laws. He's just basically skirting around the wording. He's using the wording to his advantage. Okay. So again, in this situation is, is Garrett is actually doing his job. Because what's he doing? He knows that if he tell if he told you, Miss Davenport, that no, I don't have any offers, are you gonna shoot a high offer? No, you know me, I'm gonna shoot a lower offer. But if he says, I think I have a few offers coming in, are you gonna now shoot a higher offer? Yeah, because you want to try to be the highest one. Okay? So in that situation is you want to obtain the best price in the terms. Very key here. We want to make certain that we get the best price in the terms. We also want to obtain relevant information about the other party. Okay? We want to try to get as much information as we can about this buyer or the seller. Because we need to know, is this person currently about to file bankruptcy? Is this person about to end up, uh, or why are they selling? What's the purpose of them selling? Are they selling to, to move out of town? Are they selling because of Harvey came through and flooded their house? We need to learn about those people, okay? Now, come back to that, Travis, does the listing agent have to share those things? Though? If I call you and you're listing a property, do you have to tell me about your clients? No. I have to try, but ultimately, the person I'm talking to is not gonna share that information, okay? You also have to exert the maximum effort for the client's benefit. Meaning you've got to put time and effort into their transactions. One of the biggest complaints is actually in this area as well, is that if real estate agent gets so busy that they focus all their time on what? On that one client. They have five, but where's their focus on? One of the five. And those other four end up what happened? They fall through. And then sometimes track, they'll even report them. They'll report you. And here's the worst thing about track. You want to know the worst thing about track? Is track's not fast. Track's not fast. So if you, Mr. Eugene, complain about Mr. Travis, and you put a complaint in, he's probably not going to find out about it maybe two or three years down the road. Okay? That's what he's going to find out about. Okay? So it's imperative that you understand that you're given the maximum effort, okay? You have to stay on top of it. Now, disloyalty to a client is being unethical or unprofessional. Where you're ending up, you're like, well, my job's eight to five, I get to go home. But you know there's a ton of work that needs to be done. This is not something that you take it, you know, easily. Now, I'm not saying that you can't leave the office at five o'clock and go home and work. I ain't saying that. I'm saying is you have to make certain that all loose ends are tied up. You can't push it off, okay? Doing forbidden or illegal things, okay? Trying to make deals under the table, not allowed. Also, any type of disloyalty to your client can be grounds for a forfeiture of your license, commission, or even a lawsuit for damages. For that time where Mr. Travis went and told uh, Ms. Davenport, that you would accept 350, that's disloyalty. Okay? You cannot be disclosing those things. And also, any type of possible rescission of your license or your lease contract. You end up, you provide certain information, you can lose your license if you're disloyal to your client. Okay? Disclosures. You must be full, fair, and timely. This is a big issue with some agents and even some brokers. So we'll use, say, for example, I'm just hypothetically using myself here. So I'm representing Miss Shelton, representing her in a transaction. And I get a contract for her property that she's selling. And I say, man, I'm leaving here right now at 5 o'clock and I just got a contract in. <sighs> Man, if I send this to Sheldon, she talks so much, I'm going to be on the phone till 10 o'clock tonight. You know what? I'm going on vacation tomorrow. I don't want to be dealing with this. I'm just going to set it on my desk, and I'm going to go on, on my vacation. And when I get back on Monday, I'll call. Is that okay, Travis? No. Why is that not okay? That's not timely. It's not timely by any means. 
and I'm not given full or fair disclosure. So how do I not know that Miss Sheldon may need to get out of that house quickly? And I just delayed three days. Okay. It is my duty to get whatever comes in off. Now, let me say this, Mr. Travis, let's change the terms. So it is eight, nine o'clock at night. And you got a contract. Okay. Do you have to go send it to your client at eight, nine o'clock at night? Not really. As long as you do what? First thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, eight, nine o'clock in the morning, you have it in their inbox, you're good. Okay. But what happens, Travis, let's say Stephen here gets a contract at 10 o'clock and he don't wake up till four o'clock the next day. He's, he sleeps during the day. Is that timely? No. No. So in that situation is if you know you want to sleep in, the best things to do what? Go on and send it over to them because your client might most likely is going to be what? Sleeping. Mm -hmm. Go on and just forward it over to them and go to bed. And then in your email, just say, hey, I just got this. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to bed right now. We'll discuss this sometime tomorrow. Period. They can read through it. And then at that point, what happens? Everything's conveyed. Okay. Material facts. Okay. What exactly is material fact? Well, we're going to come to DTPA here in a minute. But material fact is this. Mr. Uh, Jacob calls me and says, all right, hey, Justin, I want to buy Mr. Eugene's property. But, but the pipes behind the walls, they better be blue because I love blue. So all the pipes behind the wall better be blue, or otherwise I'm not buying the contract or buying the house. Because I want my pipes blue. Okay? Now, is that material? No. No. Does the blue really affect how the pipes work? No. Not at all. That's a what we call preference. Okay. It's a preference. So when I look here behind this wall, it's blue. It doesn't affect how it works. It's just cosmetic. That's not a problem. Mr. Jacob cannot bag out of the contract because they're not blue. But if Mr. Jacob tells me, Justin, there better be copper behind copper plumbing back here. And Mr. Eugene, you have plastic. Now, is that material? Yeah, because why? Copper is a lot more for, and it lasts most of the time a little longer than plastic. Okay? So in that situation is... Is that material fact, if you want to put this next to your slide, material fact means this. Material fact means, does it change the person's decision to still purchase that property? Okay? Does, if, if Mr. Jacob tells you, Mr. Eugene, that I want these pipes copper instead of plastic, can it change Mr. Jacob's decision about buying that if it's not copper? Yes, it's a major thing. But if the color blue is not there, they're pink, does that really cause anything? No. Okay. So when we're looking at material facts, we're looking at things that would make a person change their mind. For example, the biggest ones. What do you think the biggest number one material fact is for any buyer? Most of the time. Hugest one of them all. What do you think, Keith? Could you repeat that for me once? What do, you, what do you think is the biggest, number one, most important issue for buyers when they purchase on a house? Like if this, if this thing is present, they're not probably going to buy the house. Um, the biggest thing I would say would probably be, uh, it could go up for a number of things. I would say probably. Uh, What's the most expensive? Um, plumbing. Nope. Um, Starts with an F. Foundation. 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 There you go. Okay. Foundation. 
is the biggest one. Because if your foundation, Mr. Keith, is weak, what happens to the entire structure? Everything else is done. Oh, wow. Yes, sir. Right. So the biggest, most important is going to be the foundation. Your foundation is huge. So if Mr. Eugene goes around and he puts patches around the house to hide the foundation issues, guess what? That's a material fact. Miss, Miss uh, Davenport, you still want to buy that house if you find out there's foundation issues? No, no, she's running. She's out that door. Okay. So material facts are going to be things. So the number one is foundation. The second one is oftentimes the roof. First off, we need a strong foundation, but we also don't want to get wet. Okay. The roof is the next biggest one. Okay. Then oftentimes your plumbing, your electrical, your HVAC. But the biggest ones are basically your foundation, your roof, the structure itself, the body within it, the electrical and plumbing. These are all very important situations that everybody needs to be aware of. But again, the reason we talk about DTPA is because the fact is, is this happens, guys and gals, and I see it happen a lot. Okay? So Mr. Eugene knows that he has foundation issues. He knows he's got foundation, and he also knows, guess what else? He knows that he also has some issues with the electrical in the house. So guess what Mr. Eugene does? You ready? Mr. Eugene goes around, and he's got cracks in the walls and all. So Mr. Davenport, before you come, guess what he does? He comes and puts putty and has somebody professionally come over and paint. He putties around the foundation. He goes in, he puts a nice new coat of paint on for you, and all of the places that he has electrical issues, he cuts off the power to those spots. How do you feel about that, Miss Davenport? No. She goes by your property, she don't find out about any of this till when. After she's purchased it, you didn't disclose anything. Guess what, Mr. Eugene? She comes back and sues you under DTPA, Deceptive Trades and Practices. You were trying to hide or pull one on her, and because you did, she's going to sue you for three times actual damages. She's not something to play with in these situations. Also, disclosures. This happens to some of these unethical people. So, in this particular situation, Mr. Jacob tells Stefan, Hey, Stefan, uh, I want you to sell my property, uh, but I want to also make certain that you put in there uh, that there is, you know, there's some mold issues in the house. Stephanie goes, no, 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 Mr. Jacob, don't you dare say that. I didn't hear that. La, 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 la. I didn't hear you. And Mr. Jacob says, why? No, 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 don't tell me nothing. Because if I hear it, I got to tell somebody. Well, is that how this works, Mr. Eugene? No. No. That's not. No. You have to disclose the information. And a client should make certain that their agent is disclosing that information. Okay. I have another question. Yes, ma'am. What if, you know, as you were speaking, I know this is going to sound funny, but I thought about this. You remember Poltergeist? Say that again. Do so you remember the movie Poltergeist? Yes, ma'am. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> and they built homes on top of a cemetery. Yes, ma'am. And the builders were aware of that and they lied saying they were moving the bodies, which clearly they did not. Uh -huh. When it comes to disclosure component, shouldn't they be talking about that too? Oh yes, that's exactly what it is. And there, and okay, Miss Leela, let me tell you something. There are builders that build on top of landfills, and they will not tell their clients. There are builders <laughs> that build on top of gas stations, old gas stations. Oh my and gosh. Tell their clients. Oh, yeah. These are things, this is where it comes to you as a real estate agent. See, a lot of people think as real estate agents, all I do is I just fill out some forms and just basically that's it, okay? It's actually your duty to know about that area. That's why it's very important, like myself. I, myself, do not practice in other areas that I'm not familiar with. If I'm going to come to Houston in a certain area in Houston, I'm going to have an agent or someone that's very familiar with that area with me and that showing. 
The reason why is because, for example, Miss Leland, if I came down to Houston to sell a house, I may take you with me. And the reason why is you may know that area a lot better than I do. So you can give me more of a detail of that area. Okay. Okay. So in those situations is yes, it is truthfully an agent's responsibility to have people with them so that they can tell them and advise them, hey, this used to be a cemetery or hey, this used to be a gas station. Because I know my father probably can tell you, uh, they in Navasota, there used to be a landfill and they're trying to build a subdivision out there. And they're wanting to just put dirt over it and build a subdivision. Well, you may think that's not a problem, but Mr. Grossman, what happens if you build on top of a landfill? What could possibly be underneath your home? All kinds of stuff in your house can sink. Your house could sink. Mm -hmm. That could be radon. There could be a lot of different things underneath your house that can cause you to be, get sick. Okay? So it's imperative. It's, I, I had another one. Um, what if it's like a, like if it's a land that have a lot of, um, insects like recluse spiders and things like that nature would that be something that's that that's you could find the, out that's under the environmental protection clause okay okay so in that particular situation like i'll tell you this they were building that expressway i think it's the mo mo park or whatever in austin what happened was they were building it where it was basically supposed to cut down on time and as they were going through the building they actually found endangered species they had to stop the entire project and go out so far and back around in order for them to finish the project. So if there's any type of endangered species or there's issues or things to that nature, those all have to be disclosed as well. So very, I mean, very good information, but there's a lot of things and that comes back to the agent is did the agent do their due diligence? Okay. Mm. Did they go through and actually end up spending the time and the effort to ensure that they actually did their searches, their house searches. So very good questions though. Very good Thank questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, another one in this particular situation is that we need to make certain that um, for the customer, okay, in this particular situation, if, if it is a customer, okay, we have to make certain that as we go through here, Okay. Okay. I just I gotta share this with you real quick, everybody. Is he serious? Yes, he's serious. <laughs> so I just want y'all to hear this. So I have, like I said, I have agents that are all over the right now, and they do work and all at all different times. I just had one of my agents just text me and said, "I'm showing a client a house, and he just asked me because he's out of state. He asked me where's the best place to buy weed." <laughs> My agent would know that okay so yes there are some crazy people as you deal with when you're in real estate i promise you miss leela i will send that client your way it sounds like he needs addiction counseling so. <laughs> yeah i charge him <laughs> <laughs> so but all all shapes of form coming back to this <laughs> oh yeah I get some interesting ones, y'all. I get some interesting ones. So, <laughs> but when we come back to this, we're talking about customers, okay? So when it comes to the situation, remember, customer does not get the same care as what? As a client, okay? So a customer is allowed to know these items that are right here, okay? So in this particular situation is, Mr. Eugene, if you're representing, or not representing, if, if say for example, uh, Mr. Travis walks in and you're sitting in there and he's just somebody who walks in and he asks you questions, Mr. Knowles, you have to, in this situation, you have to disclose all of these elements to Travis. You can't conceal those, okay? So you have to disclose to Travis if there's any property defects, if there's title defects, survey issues, rights of the parties and possession, environmental safety and health issues okay you you have to disclose all of these items right here to mr travis even though travis is not your client okay now to a client if mr travis is your client you have to still give travis all of this 
but you also, Mr. Eugene, have to end up giving him your opinion of what the price is. You have to negotiate time time strategies that you would negotiate. You also would have to have other parties motivation, other parties financial status. Okay. And you have a duty also to disclose the relationships to him. Okay. So you have to disclose to him who you represent, which would be Mr. Travis. And if you're perch or if he's purchasing a house from Stefan, you have to explain to Travis that Stefan is the agent and Miss Davenport is the seller. Okay. And you have to explain those relationships as well as compensation that you're receiving from any referrals or from other third parties. You have to disclose these. Further, what we're going to talk about, if you are representing other parties, okay, say for example that you're representing um, now, actually let's change this up, let's change it up a little bit. Miss Sheldon here is representing Enrique, okay, and she's selling Enrique's property. Miss Sheldon has to, has to provide offers. She has to give the offers to her client. She has to say, hey, Enrique, we received an offer. Here's the offer. Okay. She also has to handle any counter offers, backup offers, and also any issues with equitable title. Okay. So what happens here is now people ask me this question all the time. Sheldon may say, come to my office. I'm her broker, we say, and she comes to my office and she says, well, uh, Mr. Nobles, uh, Enrique told me he does not want to see any contracts under 500,000. He only wants contracts 500,000 and up. Well, as long as Enrique puts that in writing, we could uh, obey his request. Okay. But what do you think the best practices is? What do you think the best practice? Mr. Stahl, what do you think would be the best practice that Sheldon should do? Should she still send all the offers or should she only give the ones that he wants? All of them. Why would you say all of them? It, it's kind of your duty to give them everything and let them think for themselves what they want. Hey, but you can you can send them all to them and advise like, hey, these are the five I think you would like, but here's all the other 12 that That's are correct. also coming along. But That's correct. See, this is the thing. When a client often tells you, well, I only want to see offers over 500,000. Well, Mr. Eugene, you might at that time when you said that, you might have said that when you just happened to have a ton of money in your account. And now all of a sudden you had to pay the tax man for taxes this year. And now you're broke. And now you need to end up getting that money and you need to sell it. Well, if you found out that I went over and kept or threw away offers that weren't over a certain amount, you may be furious at me, okay? So you have to provide all your offers. You also need to have the knowledge of other parties, their motivation to buy, their either buy or sell, and what's their financial strengths and weaknesses. Let me tell you guys and gals, I've had clients that my longest one I've ever had took me a year, okay? And it was because the price was extremely high. I've been on a road, thankfully, over my years, and my agents have been on a road too, that on average, we have a house sold between 60 and 90 days. Most of the time, 60 to 90 days, unless there's that wasp punch. So, but in that situation is, I was still 60 to 90 days. Oh, well, yes, it was, that's true. We still did, that's right. Even with wasp punch and COVID, we can, we can still get your house sold. But in that situation is, uh, we do end up, you need to know their motivation. What is exactly their motivation? Is Enrique selling because he's getting divorced? Is Sheldon buying because she's getting married? Or uh, is Miss Davenport having a child and so she needs the extra room? These are all things you need to know because it tells you the importance. If your client says, ah, Travis, I'm just looking to be looking, do you really need to be hustling? Not really, okay? But if, if for example, Sheldon comes to you and tells you, Mr. Uh, Travis, that she is ending up in this particular situation, that she is about to have a kid, and she needs a place. Now, is that important? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you need to be understanding of what their motivation is, and also what their financial strengths and weaknesses. Now, question for both Mr. Travis and Mr. Stahl. 
Does your clients ever voluntarily just give this to you? No, no. Clients don't ever just volunteer information. I can tell you that for a fact. Okay. Clients hold a lot of this information hush hush. So in that situation is you have to be very careful. Okay. Now, in regards to the status of earnest money deposits, okay, you have an important a situation that you make certain that there are certain uh, earnest money deposits that have to be put in. So, for example, when a client signs a contract, if uh, Enrique signs a contract today, Mr. Grossman, how many days do we have to get that earnest money deposited? Why do we only have three days? Why can't we do ten? What's the contract say? It says, three it says three days. Do you get to make any changes to that? No, you can't change that part. You can't change that part. So you've got to have it receded within three days. Okay? So again, the, in practice, the status of the earnest money is that it's the agent that delivers. Now, that works here in Bryan College Station and in smaller areas. But what happens if you live in Houston, like Miss Leela? She, if you're part of what we call FAR in Houston, Miss Leela has coverage the whole state of Texas. So Miss Leela has a client that's looking down in Pearland, and then she comes back to her house, and the client says, "Hey, I want to go buy that house in Pearland." It's pretty difficult for Leela to have to go and receive her earnest money. Okay, so in that situation, is, is you have to make certain that you make changes, or you. you basically work it out. Whoop. Buyer's financial condition. Again, we got to make certain that the seller client discloses any negative information, okay, about in this situation, we need to know about any negative information to the buyer, okay? But the buyer's agent cannot disclose to the seller's customer. Here's the thing, okay? So if they have, if the buyer's financial condition, you have to give it to the seller client, you have to disclose any negative information about the buyer. But if there's a buyer's agent, this is where it comes in, there's a buyer's agent, you can't disclose nothing. Okay? So in this situation, this comes back to what we talked about before. If I walk in to Mr. Jacob and I tell Mr. Jacob, hey, Mr. Jacob, uh, I, need, I want you to sign a contract with me, and Mr. Jacob refuses, he is a customer. He is not my client. So therefore, I have to disclose anything that Mr. Jacob says to the selling agent. But if Mr. Jacob signs a contract, he's now my client, and I am now a buyer's agent, so anything he tells me is confidential. Okay? Now, you will get some clients that will say, well, I just want to sign, I want to stay with you forever, so I want to sign a buyer's rep so I don't ever have to worry about this issue. Well, what did we just talked about earlier? Can I, can I lock somebody into a contract indefinitely? No. Normally two years is normally the maximum. Okay. Now, full disclosure. Okay, when we're dealing with the price of the property. The opinion of price is only going to be given to a client not a customer. And when we come up with an opinion of price, it's not an appraisal. What do we call it, Mr. Grossman? Right. What do we call an opinion of price? What do we run? What's this thing where oh, we use these? It's a CMA or a BPO. A CMA or a BPO. The CMA is a comparative market analysis. A BPO is a broker price opinion. They're still the same thing. I'm just looking at comparable properties to determine, Mr. Eugene, I looked at these properties and they look similar to yours. My recommendation is this is what the price is, okay? Now, Ms. Davenport, we asked this the other day. Is my opinion of price going to be the exact same as Stephanie's? How about Mr. Eugene's? No. So it's an opinion. And because it's an opinion, we're all going to have different values, okay? Now, again, changes in price are also going to occur during listing periods. This is how I handle things. If I go out to Miss uh, Leela's house to list her house, I walk out there to Miss Leela's house and I'm looking at it, and Miss Leela says, well, my house is worth a million dollars. 
and I say, Miss Leland, your house is not worth a million dollars. It's worth only 500. And she says, no, my house is worth a million dollars. Now, this is what happens with most real estate agents. Either one of them is just going to say, I'm out. I ain't got time for this crap and walk away. Okay. And then you're going to have another one that's going to say, I'll list it. And then you got Justin here who walks in and says, I'll list it, Miss Leela, but there's, there's terms to me listing it. And the terms is this. We're going to end up, I'll list your house for $1 million. But after 30 days, you got to let me reevaluate and either let me do a CMA or let me host a realtor tour and have other professionals come into your house, look at your house and give me their opinion about it. And then we will take the average of that and drop your price. You see how you deal with this when you're negotiating with clients. Just because a client might think that their house is worth What's yours right now? 200? Yeah. Okay. 200,000. What's the thing? But tell them, I'll do it. I'll put it for 30 days. And if nobody shows, then you've got to let me go over and do a realtor tour. And we're going to see what the average is. And we'll take the average of that person and we got to drop it. And you put that in special provisions. Okay. So again, there are changes that do occur during the listing period. Sometimes you may get a client that's outrageous on their price. I go to Miss Leela and Miss Leela tells me, I want to list my house for $10 million. At that point, probably just wise for me to do what? Get an independent appraiser. Miss Leela, how about we actually get an appraiser to come out? Okay, and let's let them come out and appraise your property. Okay, that's where you need to come in. Do you have a question? All right. Now, commission splits. This is where this is where everybody's gonna peak up. That's where everybody's attention is gonna get get away here. What's that? Uh huh. Everybody's up now, right? We talk about the money. Woo! Eyes big. Okay. All right. So commission splits are basically this. Let's just put it this way. Y'all want to take some notes here. So commission split is this, is Mr. Eugene, when you go over and you represent it, Ms. Davenport and selling her house and you get 3%, does that 3% go to you, Mr. Eugene? It goes to me. Why me? Why not you? That's right. All commission, all monies must go to the broker. A real estate agent can never re-emphasize that, never have any money in their possession that's wrote to them. Okay? Now, let me re-emphasize this. Mr. Grossman, can Ms. Davenport give you a earnest money check wrote out to a title company? Can you get that? Yes, I can. Yes, you can. But Ms. Davenport, when you get to her property, she says, you know what, Stephan, I'm just going to write the check out to you, and then you can go cash it and go give them the money. Is that okay? Then I cannot take it. Why can't you take it? That's right. The money has to always be written to the individual it's supposed to go to. Never you. Now, what happens if you get to Miss Davenport's house to get the money and she says, I'm out of chips. Here, here's your 2000 in cash. Can you take that? No, Miss Davenport's right. No. You cannot take cash. Why is that? Because here's the thing. What if, and I'm not saying Ms. Davenport this, but what if Ms. Davenport had all fake bills? And she gives you 2,000 in fake bills. And then you get down to Travis, to tie the company, and Travis goes over there and marks them and finds out everyone's fake. She may come back and say, what? Well, I gave you real bills. What did you do with it, Stephanie? See the problem? Okay. Robbed or something. That's right. You could get robbed. You may run off with the money. Who knows? Okay. So as an agent, you can never, ever, ever have number one money wrote to yourself. Number two, you never take cash. Okay. The commission is always between the broker and the principal. 
I'm going to say that again. The commission is always between the broker and the principal, never the salesperson. Okay? Now, how this works, and this is where everybody's different, and this is where everybody's ears are going to pop, and they're all going to peek up. Okay? When we deal with commission splits, commission splits are very dependent on a lot of factors. There are real estate companies that are out there that will host you as a, they'll sponsor you for a 100 zero split. Sounds great, right, Travis? Oh, yeah. 100 zero split. Heck yeah. I'm on board. I'm jumping on that. But here's the thing when Travis goes over to get support, you think he's getting any support? Zippo, none. And if he wants support, oh yeah, we, we do offer support, Mr. Travis. That's only $500 a month. Oh, you want the, the, the technology packet too? That's another $500 a month. You want a desk? Oh, you want a desk? That's $1,000 a month. So we're already at $2,000 a month. You want to print stuff? You oh, you want to print? That's another $2,500 a month. Okay? So they're not, they set them up to sound all perfect, but they're not. Okay? So, and I'm not, understand, what I'm talking here is only talking about things that you're going to be offered. Okay? You're going to have other brokers that are going to end up saying, well, Miss Davenport, you should come on with us. We have a big name, so you should come on with us. Well, there's benefits to a big name, but here's the problem. It's just like when you go to a church, okay? You go to a big church, what happens, Miss Davenport? There's thousands of people in the congregation. Do they know you one-on-one? -on -one? No, you're just a number, okay? It's just like a school. You go to Texas A&M and take a basic class, an academic class, you're probably in a classroom with over a thousand students. Does your, does your professor know your name? No. Nope. Do they care? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. So in that situation is, it's like I tell people That's all the time is, go. huh? That's what you don't go. That's when you don't go, right? right? What are you going to learn anything? Nope. Nope. Okay. So in that situation, <laughs> yeah, that's why you fail. That's why I went to play. <laughs> So that's the key thing is, is that you want to end up, you want to have that one-on-one -on -one individualized touch. You want people there. I, I can tell you this for a fact. A lot of these large firms, I'm telling you this for a fact. When I talk to people, a lot of times they'll say, well, I'm going to go sign off with this one big firm. Okay, that's great. I have nothing against that firm. But let's look at something. Let's pull all their agents. They have 500 agents. Okay. Now let's see how many of these 500 have actually sold in the past year. Guess what you're going to find out? Maybe 20 of that 500 is actually sold. And the other 480 have been paying that $500 a month just so they can have that brand. Okay. So in these situations is you have to look at the sharing. You look at the stuff. Guys and gals, I had one student and again, I don't care where you go. If that's your business. You do what you want. I'm here to educate you. I had one student one semester. Great guy, smart kid. I thought he would make it. I thought he would make a lot of money. And I tried everything I could to get him on with my firm. But he listened to the normal strategy of all these other ones. And he went to another big firm. And he had $10,000 to his name. In one year, that firm milked him out of that entire ten thousand dollars. One year. Guess how many sales he had? Zero. Zippo. And the, his reasoning why they said he wasn't making sales was this. Well, it's because you didn't complete these other trainings. Oh, and by the way, that's another thousand dollars for each one. Okay. See, my guys and gals can tell you just from experience, do you really need a ton of trainings? No. no. All you need to do is be able to talk to people. Yeah. You can talk to people and make relationships. That's all you need. You don't need a fancy office. You don't need a fancy desk. You don't need a, in, in reality, y'all some of my top producing agents don't ever show up to the office because they're always out in the field hustling. Okay. That in that situation is, is very important. 
So when we get to these fee sharing arrangements, I always tell people this all the time. Would you rather have 100% of nothing or 50% of something? That's the thing. And let me tell you, as you see, and I can just tell you from all the brokerages in town, I deal with a bunch of brokers, we have meetings together and all, I can tell you this from experience. If Miss Davenport comes into my office and starts working, and she's making a ton of sales, what do you think I'm going to do to her commission over time? She's making a ton of sales. Do I want to lose her? No. Heck no. So what am I going to do? She's going to get more money. She's going to get more money, and I'm going to drop her pack. That's the whole thing. That's one of my key things. I talked to some brokers. One broker said, if an agent makes five years in a row as number one agent, they drop them from their 70 30, so they pay 30 to the broker and 70 to the, so they get keep, they put it to 90 to that agent, 10 for the broker. But they have to be five years in a row, top agent. And I was like, that's not a bad idea. If an agent is the top broker or a top agent for the entire firm, five years in a row, yeah, they should get more money because they're hustling their butt off. Okay? But if an agent is over there, and say Stefan, I'm taking on Stefan, this is not true, but Stefan's over here, and he's been the longest with the brokerage, but he only makes one sell a year, he should not be entitled to that split. I'm trying out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> he makes one lease a year for $500. <laughs> but in the situation is, yes, there are many different fee sharing arrangements. The key thing that happens, and I'm just going to tell you all, when y'all go out there and start interviewing with people, go out there and look at it not from the perspective of how, how much money, number one, am I going to make, and what can I do for you? You need to be asking, what can you, Mr. Broker, do for me? What services can you provide to me? I can tell you one thing just right now. You go ask us in this town, how many brokers are going around actually at 5.30 at night teaching classes? I uh, probably could be almost 100% on this, zero. Well, oh, myself, I'm sorry, <laughs> myself. Very rarely does that happen, okay? But the, thing, the key thing is in this situation is guys and gals, is that there are many different fee sharing arrangements. There are many different ways on how they're gonna fit it. But you've got to look out for yourself. But here's the key thing. When you're first starting as a real estate agent, don't focus on the money. Focus on what training you're going to get. Let me explain training. There are plenty of brokerages that I have heard of. Their training is Stefan, in order for him to step up 5% in his commission, has to come in here and train agents. Well, if Stefan's only making one sell a year, do you really want him training you? No. No, but you don't know that. You don't know that. You don't know how many sales he's made. So in those situations is, is the training actually legitimate training? Is there somebody that I can call 24 hours if I got a question? And I'm not saying somebody. I'm talking about, can I call and get a hold of the broker if I need to? Okay? I tell you, very few, not saying just myself, there are very few of us that actually engage with our agents. There are plenty of agents in town, or any brokers in town, that don't even, they don't even meet their agents. They have a team lead. I put, uh, for College Station, Travis, today, boom, you're a team lead. And from now on, you're going to meet with all the new people. Bye. I'm going to go down to Miami and go enjoy my life. Did you just recruit for me? I. Yeah. Don't know nothing, right, at that point. So in that situation is, you need to watch for these things. Okay? There's a reason I have agents all over. There's a reason I get agents constantly calling wanting to come on. And I'm like, nope, sorry. It's very selective because I like to keep my group small. I like to be able to still talk to my people, engage with my people, have interaction with them. Okay? My people need something, I'm there. Okay? Disclosures. They need to be in writing. Any type of split must be in writing. Okay? We'll talk about trail form here later on, okay? Contract provisions. We need to explain the provisions of the contract. We have a duty to explain them. We also have to disclose any pertinent facts 
and explain any meanings of the factual or business details. Confidentiality. Why is this a big one? Well, confidentiality is, number one, there's certain information that you're going to know about that ends up, needs to stay confidential, not only during the transaction, but after the transaction. Okay? We have to keep it hush-hush. Now, again, remember, customers are entitled to factual information about the property, but not the personal information about the client. Okay? In accounting, we have to make certain that any monies that come into the office must be held in trust. A agent can never open an account on their behalf. Say that again. An agent can never open an account on their behalf. The broker is the only one that can open a trust account. Commingling is strictly prohibited. I don't care, Mr. Eugene, that you got kids and you're about to go live on the street and all, and, and you, but you, you, you about to die without Ms. Davenport's $2,000. I'm sorry, we don't care. Okay, we don't. We don't care, sorry. Ms. Davenport, remember, is the client. Ms. If you need to borrow some money, you need to talk to Ms. Davenport, okay? But don't you dare go taking her earnest money and using it for your bills, okay? Unacceptable. Signed releases from both parties. Any monies that are in earnest money or trust, everybody needs to sign off on it, okay? Trust account rules are set by TREC under the 22 Texas Administrative Code 535.159. And again, in Texas, brokers generally do not hold the earnest money. It goes to a third party person, either an attorney or a title company. Okay. And again, I love that because I don't want to hold your money. <laughs> Too much liability comes with that. Now, the minimum services. Okay, so these are actually your minimum service that you have to provide as a real estate agent. So the licensee can be suspended or revoked for violating any exclusive agency of another broker. What this means is Enrique has a exclusive right to sell. Enrique has an exclusive right to sell Mr. Jacobs' property. Stefan goes to work or works with Mr. Jacob at the same place. And Stefan starts going around talking about how stupid and idiotic Enrique is. He don't know what he's doing. He's dumb. He don't know what the hell's going on. Mr. Jacob, you need to just fire him. I'm so much better than him. Blah, 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 blah. That sounds just like Stefan. That sounds like Stefan, right? Okay. Well, guess what? Mr. Grossman, your license can be suspended or revoked because guess what? You are violating the exclusive agency of another broker. Okay? You cannot talk bad about another agent or another broker, and your license can be suspended. The broker representing a party or listing real estate agent for sale is that party's agent and must inform the client of the material information. So the real estate broker that represents a party or listing, so either buyer or seller, is that party's agent. And you have to inform that client of any material information. Meaning, Mr. Eugene, when you're representing Ms. Davenport and you find out that there is termites in the property, you gotta tell her. You can't not tell her so she'll continue to purchase the house. You have to disclose that information to Ms. Davenport, okay? This is the best one, this is my favorite, which is common sense, right, Ms. Davenport? Did you know that you have to actually answer your client's questions? Travis, did you know that? We actually have to answer our clients. I got a lot of people have to call them. We gotta actually, we better get on the phone, man. I, mean, I, got, I got stuff to do. We, we, we gotta get on the phone right now, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, you have to answer your client's questions. I'm send them to Linda. Oh, send them to Linda. That's a good idea. Yeah. Send them where, where is Linda on tonight? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, we'll, we'll just send them over to Linda. Yeah. That's what we'll end up doing. We'll send them to her. Now, Mr. Eugene, she'll like that, right? Tell him to now. Okay. We also... Eugene, I have a spare bedroom. 
We also must present any offers to or from the client. Okay, we have to give it to them. We also are prohibited from telling another broker to negotiate directly with the broker's clients. So for example, a lot of agents will do this stuff. So we're gonna pick on Garrett tonight. So Garrett goes over and he's a lazy agent, okay? So he goes around and, and he takes a listing for Mrs. Sheldon and, and says, oh, Miss Sheldon, I'll take your listing for $500, okay? Miss Sheldon goes over, pays him $500, he puts it on the MLS, and then he puts in there, any questions, please contact Sheldon. Well, here's the problem. If he's representing Miss Sheldon, can any of us as a broker or an agent talk to Garrett's client? No, we can't. We cannot talk to Garrett's client because the fact is that's Garrett's client. And if we do, Garrett is now making us violate this code, which then can make us lose our license. And how many of y'all want to lose your license because Garrett's lazy? Okay. Ain't that right, Garrett? Am I, am I correct here? You, you, you lazy, sir? Uh, no, sir. <laughs> he, he in this situation would be the opposite, actually. He would be on top of it. But in the situation is, yes, you cannot subject your clients to end up to not, you know, basically refer them off. Okay. Now, here's a note. The sole delivery of an offer to a party does not violate, however, the code. So if I happen to get an offer from Miss Leela and I just send the offer to Mr. Eugene, just delivering an offer actually doesn't violate the contract if the party's broker consents to delivery and copies the party's broker and the person delivering the offer does not engage in activity violated. So I can in this situation, I can actually set up the MLS where Ms. Leela has to submit her offer through a drop box and that drop box goes to Mr. Eugene and I don't end up doing nothing. I'm not violating anything because guess what? Ms. Leela is sending it and I've consented to it. Ms. Leela sent it on over to Mr. Eugene. Mr. Eugene got the contract. Guess what? We're good. Okay. But here's the thing is Mr. Eugene cannot go and negotiate with Ms. Leela if he's represented by me. You hear that again? If Mr. Eugene is represented by Justin, he cannot talk to Ms. Leela. Ms. Leela has to end up in the situation, she has to talk to the broker, okay? Now, the information about brokerage services, okay? This IABS form basically states that the licensees are required to disclose representation to all parties in the transaction, and the disclosure can be made orally or in writing unless your firm has a policy about written disclosures, okay? So again, you must provide this notice to all parties, no matter what. The IABS is the information form only and contains no disclosure of the licensee's actual representation of anyone. It's an optional form that's provided by TREC that includes the written statement required by a trailer. Okay. The TREC form in itself is optional, but the language is required. Okay, so your payment of a fee to a broker does not necessarily establish that the broker represents you. So for example, Mr. Eugene, you may be selling your house and Ms. Sheldon came to your house and you're using Ms. Sheldon, but she, you signed a commission split that you're gonna give 3% to a buyer's agent. When you pay me 3%, it does not mean that I'm looking out for your best interest. Okay, so what are some key points tonight? Well, we talked about agencies and business transactions. We talked about a variety of agency relationships. We discussed the three types of agency. It was universal, general, and special. 
Understand also that a real estate licensee may not perform an appraisal on real estate property unless the licensee is a licensed or certified appraiser. We also discussed what OCAR is. We discussed the greater duties to a client and the risk graders with the client, as well as the duties of third parties. We also talked about the IABS and its equivalency. For a broker, it is imperative that your broker that you get sponsored by has a development company program that basically talks about the implications of agency relationship, fiduciary duties, also a train their associates how to avoid unintended agency, the broker's responsibilities for licensees professional actions as well. So, Miss um, Sheldon, what type of information is a listing broker required to tell a buyer even when the seller wants to conceal that information? Um, material. Why is that important? Because if someone has a shot foundation and the um, broker knows about it and doesn't disclose of that information, then um, he's being dishonest and could get legal um, action after that and cause the client legal action as well. Exactly. Very good job there. All right, Mr. Garrett, what types of relationships with a prospective buyer should a listing broker disclose to the seller? Uh, that's, that's always the best answer all the time. <laughs> if they're family. Why is that important? Uh, they might look out for their family member rather than their client. So if I am, if I'm your brother and I'm also representing Miss Davenport on purchasing your house, I may be unfairly advantaging you over Miss Davenport because we have a relationship. Yes, sir. What happens? Let's change the subject here. Miss Davenport, let me ask you this. What if me and you worked together and I'm listing your house and I'm also representing the buyer of your house? Could there be a, uh, an issue there? Why is that? Because what might happen? Whose interest am I going to look out for more? For you, right? Okay. So there are certain relationships with a prospective buyer that we have to look out for. Mr. Grossman, discuss the information that, that we have learned that must remain confidential even after the relationship is terminated. Um, anything financial or, uh, you mean I can't go out and tell Mr. Eugene that you sold a house for $500,000 over list? Why not? Because it's for the personal information. Can I go tell Mr. Travis everybody in the world that I represented Chuck Norris and selling his house? No. Why not? It'd be nice. Be nice, right? Yeah, be cool, yeah. But unfortunately, you can't. Okay. So, tonight we ended up, we covered a lot of information. A lot of information. So, we are going to go ahead and call this a class. We will pick up tomorrow with chapter three, and we'll keep moving forward. Okay. All right, so everybody have a good night, get you some rest, and I'll see you all tomorrow.